Hey, I'm Josh Kassoff from <coughs> Texas Cannabis Collective. I'm here today with the man, the legend, the uh, commissioner of the Texas Department of Agriculture, Mr. Sid Miller. How are you doing today? I'm good. Good to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, glad for thank you for uh, joining us today. So I wanted to start off with uh, your tenure as the commissioner of the uh, Texas Department of Agriculture. So what have been some of the accomplishments or uh, awards that you guys have gotten that you're most proud of as being commissioner? Well, we've, got, we've gotten several over the years. One, this, this most recent probably has more meaning than any of them is we just went through the sunset process, and that's a state agency that reviews every, every state agency on a, a 10 to 12-year rotation. Uh, we just finished ours the last legislative session. And the Sunset Commission reported to us that we were the highly efficient, physically responsible, and the best run state agency in state government. So we're we're pretty proud of that. We have a lower turnover rate than most other state agencies. Um, so we we've, we've got a good thing going on here. Proud of my employees. That's great to hear. Um, and so <clears throat> as someone, you know, such as yourself who's been in Texas agriculture for you know many more decades uh, before you became commissioner and your family as well. Uh, I was reading on your website there's eight generations of farmers in your family or something. We started farming in 1700. Wow! And, uh, and so we we've been around a while, fought in the Revolutionary War, Civil War, and all the rest of them. That's incredible. So why do you feel that Texas has such a strong agriculture industry, such a strong backbone or, you know, so many advantages when it comes to agriculture in Texas? Well, you know, we we're so diversified in climate and topography and and, and geographical regions. You know, we we lead the nation agriculture exports, cattle, cotton, wool, mohair, horses, sheep, goats, hay. List goes goes on and on. Grapefruit, uh, so it, it we we grow over six hundred specialty crops in this state. Six hundred specialty crops. Wow. You know that's like uh, olives and aloe vera and peaches and pecans and you know stone fruit, blueberries, just all kinds of things that you really don't think of Texas. You know when when you think of those type of crops, but we're we're involved in those. So it's it, it's a powerhouse. Contributes over two uh, two hundred and thirty four billion dollars to our economy. Employs over two million people, and we export uh, fifteen billion dollars worth of agriculture goods just from our state. That's incredible. So I wanted to ask next about uh, Texas hemp, and I know uh, so in the weeks in the weeks leading up to the twenty eighteen farm bill um that and the Texas measure that authorized the cultivation of hemp. I remember you being very supportive and very vocal about how Texas hemp could be great in Texas. So what were those first few years like of hemp cultivation in Texas? And where do you think hemp has the possibility to go in the future in Texas? When we you know, the 2018 Farm Bill passed and allowed states to grow hemp, we still couldn't grow it here. We had legislate, state legislation we had to overcome, get it off the books as being labeled a narcotic. So we did that. So that allowed us to enter the, the hemp market. <clears throat> the problem was it was so new. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of disinformation. Uh, wasn't as much science as we needed, but we launched. And but we, we have good science now, much better science. We we know we know uh, the ailments it can it can uh, affect and in. in uh, uh, help cure and alleviate, uh, you know, sleepless nights, pain, uh, all, all kinds of stuff that it, all the positive benefits of the CBD oil. And now I see a shift in the industry. It looks like we're really taking a good hard look at the industrial market, the fiber market. And I think that's the next next new horizon on, on the field for hemp in Texas is an expanding uh, industrial hemp market. And where do you see that going in Texas with the industrial hemp market? Well, we've, we've got we've got a processor here in Taylor. We've got one going in Wichita Falls, Lubbock, one down in South Texas. So it's kind of the chicken and the egg. We don't know which is first, but we need to get started. So once there's a place to sell it, the farmers will grow it. And uh, they'll be very good at that. I'm talking about a traditional farmer, you know, that may have a, a, a quarter section to a section under pivot. You know, one man can farm that by himself just about. That's interesting. 
Yeah, I can definitely see that. And uh, so I know that you're still a little hesitant when it comes to fully recreational adult use cannabis, you know, on par with Colorado and California and Texas. But in recent times, I know you've become very supportive of cannabis for medical reasons. And I was reading the uh, editorial sure. you wrote last summer, the Standing Up for Compassionate Use uh, editorial, where you you know strongly affirmed that support for medical cannabis and you denounce certain current policies when it comes to cannabis, um, you know, on the federal level and somewhat on the state level. Um, and so do you feel there were any particular moments that made you support medical cannabis or has that viewpoint always been a viewpoint of yours when it comes to medical access to this plant? Well, I just, I use a thing called cowboy logic. A lot of people call it common sense. It's kind of rare anymore. But you've got oh, not a plant, uh, doesn't cause anybody any, you know, it's a plant, doesn't cause anybody harm. There's no harmful, really harmful side effects from it, unless, uh, especially if it's, you know, processed in, into medical. Uh, so I think I was quoted that, you know, hey, if, if it'll have a toothache, I'm for it. It's not, this is not near serious as things we already prescribe, like oxycodone, oxycotton, hydrocodone, fentanyl you know, narcotics, amphetamines, those, those are the bad ones. This is not, this is not a bad, harmful drug. And we've come so far along in, in the last uh, uh, six to eight years that we have very sound science. We know what medical conditions that, uh, that cannabis can treat and, and be beneficial to. So my position is we just need to open it up, quit picking winners and losers, uh, allow the doctors to develop that uh, relationship with their patient and let the doctors decide how to treat your patients and, and uh, get bureaucrats and elected uh, people out of making those decisions. Mm, that's interesting. And so when a medical cannabis program on par with other states that have a medical cannabis program where you can you know go to a dispensary and everything like that, and if a program like that were to pass in Texas, and home grow were an option, you know, the patients themselves growing the cannabis plants at home. Would you support that? You know, I think we can glean a lot from Colorado, certainly glean a lot from Oklahoma and the programs they set up there. Uh, we, we have a template. We know what works. We know what the pitfalls are. Uh, you know, I think I could support that. We'd, we'd need a very uh, well thought out, well crafted uh, piece of legislation. Uh, but I, I, I certainly think we could do it. It's 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 doable, definitely doable. That's interesting. Yeah, because I know in certain states, the patients themselves can grow the crops themselves. Here in Las Vegas, it's a different story, unfortunately. But, you know, we're hoping the laws here in Vegas will change when it comes to home growth soon. So, you know, as a, you know, I cover the law and politics surrounding cannabis. Um, so over the past several years with Texas Cannabis Collective and with a few other sites, I've uh, made sure to interview and reach out and include conservatives a lot when discussing the politics behind cannabis, because the support among the GOP when it comes to cannabis reform is increasingly growing, I feel like. And when it comes to speaking with Republican lawmakers, you know, strong conservatives such as yourself, who otherwise do vote very conservatively and lean very conservatively, how do you recommend that cannabis advocates speak with those conservative lawmakers who are still against you know, cannabis reform, medical expansion. Are there any points that those advocates should bring up or are there certain, you know, <laughs> talking points that they should maybe avoid or discuss more? I think the feeling of the legislature uh, is very positive. Uh, I haven't run an official poll, but I'm going to say probably 70 percent or more uh, of the legislature supports this position of the, of the expanding medical cannabis. I think uh, the legislators are not our problem. I think it's some in leadership that aren't quite there that we, we need to, to educate and, and work on. And uh, I, really, that's about the only thing holding it up is is some in leadership are not quite ready to, to expand the medical use. And how do you recommend advocates uh, address and speak with those you know few lawmakers that are still in the way? Or still on the fence about it. Well, I, certainly, you you want to you want to reach out to your own uh, state representative, own state uh, senator, and make sure that they're on board. If they're on board, you know, you need to converse with the 
the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the speaker of the house, but because that's ultimately who who would be holding it up. That's interesting. And why do you feel like there's this? You know, there is increasing support among the GOP, but there's still this somewhat disconnect. Why do you feel like that's present among the GOP? That there's a lot of support in the party, but there's still also significant uh, opposition. I think it's a, a lack of understanding, uh, a lack of education. Like I said, we've got the science out there now that that, that tells the story. Uh, there's no more guessing. Uh, but some of these, some of the people that that are against it, uh, they don't have all the facts. They don't have all the research. They they don't have all the new developments. Uh, they don't see see the uh, uh, fact that it has you know improved people's quality of life. Uh, but we need to get those in front of those people and, and get it, help them understand and. Uh, They'll come around eventually, I'm pretty sure of it. I'll just move on to my final question. Um, not necessarily related to what's going on in Texas, more just your experience as agriculture commissioner. Um, so here in Vegas right now, there's the Indoor Agriculture Convention. Um, and so I'm going to be attending it tomorrow because I write for a cannabis magazine out here. Um, is there anything you recommend I check out when it comes to indoor agriculture, like any trends or practices that are going on? I think the the hottest trend now is what they call vertical farming. Of course, it'd be in a greenhouse situation, and it's uh, you know eighteen twenty foot walls growing uh, crops. Uh, it's, it's kind of the, the newest innovation. Prior to that, we had hydroponics, you know, which is soils. We have aquaponics, which is growing fish and and plants together. Prior to that, it was just a greenhouse operation, you know, growing it in, in a pot in a greenhouse. But the vertical farming, you should check that out. Uh, that's the newest trend and uh, one of the most efficient ways to, to grow uh, grow crops uh, on the market now. Okay. Um, yeah, those are all my questions really for today. Um, thank you so much again. Uh, great interview. Learn, definitely learned a lot. You have- Sorry about the bad connection. Oh, no, it's okay. It, it happens. All good. Um, still a great interview. Thank you so much again, sir. Um, have a great rest of your day. Great, great rest you of your week. You have a good day. Howdy. Colt Power here. These days, many people are choosing to add CBD to their wellness routine. Why? Some like CBD for how it may help them with their focus. Others enjoy the way the plant compound may assist them with their sore muscles and relaxation. For me, CBD has been a game changer in keeping my old sports injuries managed so I can work out and be present for my family. If you've ever been curious about CBD, I invite you to check out our Texas-grown, Texas-made products at PowerBioFarms.com. That's Power, B-I-O-P-H-A-R-M-S.com. Join us on Tuesday, March 14th for the Texas Marijuana Policy Lobby Day at the state capitol. The majority agree. Texans of all political persuasions agree. It's time for cannabis law reform. There's lots to do in little time. With all lawmakers meeting only for 140 days every two years, we have a lot of work to do in a short period of time. The Texas Marijuana Policy Lobby Day. Thrive Apothecary offers an experience truly unique from anything else in Texas. A full-service cannabis solution that is doctor-owned and offers customers every level of cannabis legally available in Texas. From traditional CBD products to emerging hemp-derived THC edibles, smokables, and now medical cannabis. As a licensed medical cannabis provider, prospective patients from anywhere in Texas can book a sponsored online eligibility consultation to determine if they qualify for a medical marijuana prescription from the comfort of their own home. Plus, for Texas veterans, the first prescription appointment is donated by Thrive. Visit thrivetx.com for more information. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast. The official podcast of the Texas Cannabis Collective, distributed on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and many more, to give Texans information regarding policy, industry, and culture. And now, back to this week's show.